Back in the 1940s, a hypothesis emerged that the human body contains a fourth state of matter, plasma, in addition to the three commonly known ones. Hence, the later term biological plasma or bioplasma appeared. Despite extensive theoretical and experimental research on it, there is still no unified explanation of its processes and mechanisms. While the term bioplasma is rare in recent scientific literature, related phenomena are still being studied under different terms, such as the plasma-similar state of biological matter, ultra-weak emission, biophotons, and many others. Plasma-similar states in living matter were confirmed experimentally over time, but there are still gaps in our knowledge to be filled and big discoveries to be made, as there is data that it has direct involvement in anomalous phenomena. The very existence of such plasmatic states suggests that life can change in appearance. Not only that, thanks to fundamental key elements of life that are not dependent on organic matter and the system's overall shape, there might be life on Earth that we are not yet aware of and not recognize as such. A new interdisciplinary field emerges that may provide evidence that living organisms are created by nature within an electric skeleton and bioplasma-related phenomena. This emerging area of research has already yielded a number of interesting findings. Certain experiments suggest that the electrical characteristics of cells might contain a sort of micro-hologram of the framework in the structural grid of bioelectricity. But to fully understand its role, scientists may need to rebuild the foundations of biology by incorporating computer and information-based approaches that rely on bioelectricity and subsequently on bioplasma. For more than 20 years, a Nobel laureate Albert Sent Georgi had been relentlessly pushing physics into biology, and it was him who emphasized the significant role of bioelectricity in this context. He based a portion of his arguments upon the work done by the famous physicist Leon Brillouin, thereby prompting biologists to investigate his pioneering research on electrons and energy levels, which were named Brillouin zones. A biological cell in this special space, similar to how a room can be divided into smaller cells, the boundaries of this shape are related to the pattern being studied. The Brillouin zone helps to describe the behavior of waves in this pattern. Within this shape, there is a surface that shows where electrons with the same energy are located. It is important because it helps to understand why Brillouins had been insisting that semiconductors existed inside the body, an idea that was confirmed in the recent studies. A semiconductor is a material with electrical conductivity between that of a conductor, like copper and an insulator, such as glass. Our current electronic devices wouldn't exist without them. By introducing impurities into the crystal structure, its electrical properties can be altered in useful ways. Semiconductors are necessary for the ordered flow of electricity and that energy can move through protein molecules is another experimental fact now. St. Georgi expounded on the presence of plasma within every molecule of the body, proposing that each molecule contains an electron gas that pervades the entirety of the molecule. This electron gas, which is a negatively charged plasma, is distinct from the ionized positively charged plasmas, since electrons always carry a negative charge. This declaration was groundbreaking, as St. Georgi argued that every cell and molecule in the body was electronic and contained plasma. These ideas were deemed too radical for the scientific community and were not widely acknowledged though. However, these concepts were not forgotten. In this joint paper, Dr. Alexander Boychenko shares the following experimental results of his research. The known methods of studying physics of plasma of condensed media were used to experimentally prove the existence of a plasma-similar state of a biological matter by example of plants and their systems. One of the basic properties of the local action on bioplasma of plants is identified, namely the property to change its structural organization, thus creating conditions for various vibrations and waves propagation in bioplasma. To sum it up, 
he found that plants and their surrounding media with ionic conductivity, like electrolyte solution, soil, or nutrient media, contain a system of electrically charged particles that interact with each other in a way that's typical of plasma. It's also important that the structure of this bioplasma makes it similar to the cold plasma made in a gas barrier that is not in a state of balance. Dr. Boychenko noted that by the concentration of electrically charged particles, plants are close to doped semiconductors. The process called doping means that the semiconductor materials are modified by adding small amounts of this or that substance, so the strength of the electric flow could be varied and fine-tuned. This not only brings structure into bioelectricity, but also makes the existence of a fourth state of matter called plasma in living matter possible. The author's research shows that because a plasma-like state can exist in the space inside and between plant cells that create a strong crystal lattice, and this allowed him to experimentally prove the existence of bioplasma in plants and their systems. A key characteristic of a plasma medium is its ability to excite and propagate different vibrations and waves. This property was once used to experimentally demonstrate the existence of plasma-like states in various condensed materials. The experiment was based on principles used for detecting different wave phenomena and processes in the plasma of metals and semiconductors. However, what sets this experiment apart from previous ones is that the whole plant was used in these studies. He observed a phenomenon similar to helicon waves, a type of low-frequency electromagnetic wave that appears in an uncompensated plasma placed in an external permanent magnetic field. This is a significant finding. This proves that not only do plants have bioplasma, but they also possess electromagnetic integrity and can interact with each other in a coordinated manner. Besides the wave properties, plasma can also emit light in different ways. For example, in gas discharge plasma, light emission is the main way to know if it exists and to get information about the particles in it. It was back in the 60s when scientists found that plants and animals can also emit light without any external stimulus. They called it ultra-weak emission or biophotons. This is also a very important phenomenon. And while the scientific community is still arguing about its source, the plasma nature of biophotons was demonstrated in the recent experiment using onion roots as an example. In the peer-reviewed paper, Dr. Boychenko reported results of his experiments in which using the special photography method, plasma formations were registered in onion roots, and their existence was proven. Specifically, plasmoids being released from the cut roots and then dissipating in space. In the photo, bioplasma is clearly evident, taking the form of a distinctive torch with glowing plasmoids coming off it. Plasmoids' presence suggests that charged particles were in an excited state and concentrated in small areas behaving collectively, which is inherent in plasma. If not, the film would show tracks from particles that move independently, aren't related, and usually scatter in various directions. The paper also mentions the following. The photos of ultra-weak bioluminescence from uncut root tips are equally informative. From it, one can see that the overall structure is similar to the previous image, but the localization of the glowing areas on the growth zone has a more voluminous and symmetrical arrangement in the form of cones, with increasing brightness towards the top and a rounded base. It should be noted that none of the 50 photographs showed torches with plasmoids, characteristic of freestanding plasma formations. And the need for drastic measures to extract plasma formations from them indicates the stability of the latter in the organism's life processes. As seen from the experimental results, during the destruction of a biological object, not necessarily mechanical, energy can be transferred in the form of radiation through plasmoids, which in turn can be emitted from the biological object, in our case, from onion roots. Hence, there are grounds to assume that it is in the same plasma-like state within the biological objects, presumably forming their energetic framework. Using the photographic method, plasmoids in a free state have been registered in the onion root tips, 
which likely indicates the plasma nature of ultra-weak bioluminescence. End of quote. But before we dive into ultra-weak light emissions and biophoton research, it's important to understand the substance in which these bioelectric and plasma effects occur. This substance we are referring to is water in a very particular state. Ice. In his book, St. Georgi shared a discovery that there are many types of ice in our body, which may come as a surprise to some. To date, more than 20 types of ice made solely from water are known. Although all of these ices are made from pure water, they are different types. Another type of ice is known as hair ice, which appears as thin threads on wood rays and never on the bark. Here is St. Georgi's thoughts on the strangeness of water. Quote, when considering water structures, we enter a fantastic and fascinating world. Bridgman, in his studies on high pressure, could distinguish between half a score of different ices. But we need not go to ice to find structures in water. Bernal and Fowler showed water to have a quartz-like, crystalline structure which is different from that of common ice. The situation becomes more complex still if we consider water structures built around solid surfaces. The tendency of building structure-ordered layers around surfaces running deep into the fluid phase seems to be a general tendency of liquids. All this put together means that water within the cell may not be random water, but liquid ice. No attempts have been made yet to apply our knowledge of water structures to living systems. Living matter seems to be a system of water and organic matter, which forms one single inseparable unit, a system, as the cogwheels do in a watch. Water is not only the mater, mother, it is also the matrix of life on Earth, and biology may have been unsuccessful in understanding the most basic functions because it focused its attention only on the particulate matter, separating it from its two matrices, water and the electromagnetic field." End of quote. These layers of ice were found to be several microns deep, and the building of lattices means long-range order, in which the single molecules will collaborate collectively as one organism. So, one of the ice's roles is to create structured ordered layers in a mass of water. This also refers to the idea of a water mass containing protected or walled cells that are made entirely of water. These boundary layers and water are similar to sheaths found within plasmas. All plasmoids have sheaths enclosing them too, which helps them maintain their identities. But there is more to it. This long-range order and the single-molecule collaborative effects he described were also researched by David Frank Kamanetsky, Soviet scientist who developed the thermal explosion theory and worked on plasma physics problems. He talked about this topic back in a 1961 publication which then mysteriously vanished from all subsequent editions of Proceedings of the USSR Academy of Sciences and its English reprint version. In his article, Frank Kamanetsky wrote, quote, One of the essential characteristics of living matter is a certain degree of ordering of the microstructure. Analysis of a number of experimental data says that water in the body at temperatures above zero degrees is partially structured meaning the arrangement of its molecules manifests to some extent a long-range order. The ideas about collective levels of semiconductor-type excitation are becoming increasingly widespread. Excited electronic states play an important role in the accumulation and migration of quantized energy in the body. But if initially they were understood as excited levels of individual molecules, further studies then clearly indicate in favor of collective levels. Such collective levels arise in the presence of long-range order. The question of the long-range order and living matter is of a deep fundamental interest. The analogy with semiconductors allows us to hope that collective excitation levels and energy zones of the semiconductor type are a more general manifestation of orderliness. The orderliness we postulate is specific to living matter, but it would be even more important to find experimentally an orderliness that disappears after death. The existence of such zones is also important because new biological effects can be expected from them." End of quote. 
So can this specific to living matter long range order then be a key to a fundamental understanding of what life is and how it emerges out of non-organic matter? He also noted that the structures like semiconductors and living matter can demonstrate phenomena similar to electron plasma in a gas discharge. And the presence of plasma and ice, as previously demonstrated by St. Georgi, then can spontaneously self-organize structures that support long-range order in all living organisms. This discovery adds a new dimension to the argument. But why do we need so many different types of ice in our body? And how does it help to create long-range order and collaborative effects in a living matter? A hint can be found in the phenomenon of criticality. This phenomenon can help to explain why many complex systems, such as avalanches or our cell networks, suddenly behave in new ways and gain new abilities. And such critical phenomena arise in transitions. The idea is that if the system is just on the edge of the order and disorder and goes through the phase transition, such as water changing from ice to liquid, the system moves through what's known as a critical point. In a moment of transition from one phase to another, exotic properties emerge. And such small change in the critical variable leads to drastic changes, almost discontinuing changes in the function. A simple magnet can demonstrate critical dynamics. Atoms in the magnet can have spin directed either up or down, with all spins pointing in one direction when the magnet is very cold. When heated, the spins start to move, change direction, and cancel each other out. This causes the magnet to fall off the metal surface, indicating a transition from being ordered to disordered. During this transition, clusters of similarly oriented spins form throughout the magnet. In 1987, physicist Purbach proposed the idea of self-organized criticality, where many complex systems in nature may organize themselves around critical points. To explain his theory, Bach used the example of a sand pile. When the sand pile gains enough mass, the grains of sand can no longer stay in place due to friction. Adding a single grain of sand to the pile will trigger an outsized effect, causing avalanches to cascade down the sides of the sand pile. Similarly, natural systems self-organize around critical points without needing tuning. Examples include various complex systems where long-range order is needed. In the body, these systems may operate slightly subcritical, meaning they approach the critical point but then push away to avoid danger. The different types of ice mentioned before, hence, can help to fine-tune the matrix where these processes can occur then. Uno Kapvilium, Soviet physicist, in his little-known article independently came to similar conclusions. He wrote, quote, Life can be imagined as an avalanche process in a very complex biological resonator, feeded by some source of potential energy. The main avalanche, which coincides with the lifetime of the organism, consists of myriads of sub-avalanches and elementary resonators of the system. Interestingly, the initial conditions of the avalanche launch, precisely the state of the universe at the moment of birth, play, according to the theory, an important role in the unfolding of the dynamics of a living system. The active elements of these resonators are cell membranes, which consist of giant molecules, mass dipoles. These processes are very vulnerable to the effects of external fields, but nature has provided protection against them. Calculations show that systems of giant electric dipoles and membranes can be receivers of ultra-weak physical signals at or below the level of quantum noise. These possibilities of living organisms have not been studied at all. They may be the sources of anomalous phenomena that have not yet been explained. End of quote. He further wrote that the geometry of the resonator network and nerve branches can be fractal, like a Sierpinski carpet an idea that has a direct connection to the physics of criticality. Such structures do not tolerate empty space. The change of just one unit leads to the rearrangement of all its links. Such a mechanism ensures the variability of a living system with small disturbances when a certain place is prepared in the structure to react on a trigger. Interestingly, a quantum biological model that Kotvillium described can be implemented from various materials. 
Theoretically, such living systems can exist in any form and can be ultimately non-organic, meaning that such life form can change beyond recognition. Therefore, theoretically, there may be living systems on Earth that we don't know anything about. The latest experimental results in biology shows that a man is not only a purely biological construct, but that bioelectronic, biochemical, and informational processes also play a role. Today's theories are based on a profound vision of Sent Georgi. It was he who first realized the importance of the intricate and dynamic structures that can naturally arise from materials such as ice, water, and plasma. But in order to understand the implications of his research and see how it works in practice, we should look at superconductivity and Josephson junctions first. Brian Josephson's invention, which regulates electric currents in complex machines, played a pivotal role in the development of electronics and quantum computing. This achievement later earned him the Nobel Prize. He also became interested in the mind-body problem and is one of the few scientists to argue that parapsychological phenomena telepathy, psychokinesis, and other paranormal themes may be real. This led to the exploration of superconductivity and Josephson junctions in nature, particularly in human bodies, where features resembling Josephson junctions have been later identified. Now, to explain them, we should look into superconductivity first. Electrical conduction occurs when electricity flows along a wire, when it flows through a material with no resistance, it's called superconductivity. This phenomenon cannot occur without the principles of quantum mechanics and is also one of the rare occurrences where quantum effects are visible on a macroscopic level. Now, initially, it was believed that superconductivity only occurred at extremely low temperatures, but later it was discovered that it can occur at higher temperatures and even in the human body. In a superconducting state, current can flow without any resistance, creating an electric version of a perpetual motion machine. This means that if the current flows in a coil under suitable conditions, it can continue to circulate forever without needing to be recharged. Interesting effect arises when a supercurrent could jump over an insulating barrier connecting two superconductors using quantum tunneling into a system. This was a groundbreaking discovery, as it allowed the flow of current to be modified by adjusting the insulating barrier. If electricity flows too strongly, it can overload electronic devices and cause damage. And if it cannot flow at all through an insulator, it won't help either. Josephson junctions made it possible to use superconducting electricity of semi-strength that could be fine-tuned, and this makes our most advanced electronic devices possible. Albert Sent Georgi and Freeman Cope, among others, have shown that the human body has organic semiconductors. These semiconductors can act as the necessary barriers for the Josephson junction to occur in our bodies. The proximity effect can trigger the jump between two superconducting currents that are close enough to each other and can influence each other, leading to a Josephson effect when an organic semiconductor is present. Now, to grasp the significance of these discoveries, we must examine the work of biochemist Freeman Cope, who found evidence suggesting that some nerve functions are controlled by superconduction. Cope believed that the ability of organisms to sense weak magnetic fields can be explained only by a biological superconductive Josephson junction. Moreover, he published this paper discussing how Josephson junctions enable organisms to detect not only weak magnetic fields, but also microwaves. His research remains classified, and Cope's full paper has never been published. His further work related to bioplasma led to even more surprising discoveries. In this paper, he reported that not only every human being contains a superconductive plasma, but also, quote, experimental evidence suggests that all objects, and especially living objects, contain and are surrounded by diffuse clouds of matter energy, probably best considered as a superconductive plasma state, end of quote. He explained that according to Einstein's special theory of relativity, 
it would be impossible for an outside observer to measure most physical parameters inside that plasma system. But even though it's impossible to measure what is happening inside these clouds, we can see what effects they have on things outside of them. High voltages like in Kirlian photography can help us see these effects. Cope explains that when superconducting plasma is around, it makes neighboring molecules less likely to absorb or emit light. This helps energize a group of molecules more easily. This plasma can also help make laser and maser-like actions from these molecules, which we can use to find out if the plasma is there. The evidence of solar terrestrial links suggests that diffuse superconductive plasma may reach the Earth as radiation from extraterrestrial sources, especially from the Sun. Cope proposed that such superconductive plasmas scattered inside living and non-living things. These plasmas could also get trapped inside materials, because once inside, they require a certain amount of energy to be removed. This also reminds a lot of the properties of exotic vacuum objects. Special collective plasma states that once produced also stay in the materials, particularly metals, indefinitely and need extra energy supplied to be removed, as described by Ken Shoulder's experimental work. In living matter, a superconductive plasma results in the light emitted in a very narrow band of frequencies that is characteristic of coherent light similar to laser, and this can be observed experimentally. And in fact, such coherent laser-like light was reported in the works of Fritz Albert Popp and his team. Primarily the abnormally high laser-like coherence and the so-called squeezed light. What does all of this mean for our discussion in this video? It is fundamental. As suggested by Cope's research, the superconductive plasma inside our bodies interacts with our physical selves, as well as with universal electromagnetic fields and possibly microwaves. Essentially, Cope found that our bodies have a plasma-based interface that can be influenced by these fields. Later, there was a surprising addition to this topic from Europe. A team of five researchers who were well known for their work on biophotons published a paper that independently confirmed superconductivity in living things. Specifically, they focused on the presence of Josephson junctions in biological systems. The authors were interested in understanding what it meant for an organism's elementary components to exhibit associate behavior that results in long-range order. Quote, One of the authors and his co-workers have, over many years, found evidence that Josephson-like phenomena are occurring in living systems. The first piece of evidence came in 1975, that there is a small superconductive region a dispersion of such regions could give rise to an alternating current Josephson effect. A pair of nearby cells acts as a Josephson junction, which gives rise to an intercellular coherence. End of quote. In other words, the interactions between neighboring cells through Josephson junctions arrays create a state of organized complexity within organisms. Therefore, it's crucial to rebuild the foundation of biology by incorporating computer and information-based approaches, just as Michael Levin and his team at Tufts University are doing in their investigations of bioelectricity. Their experimental results are mind-boggling. In Levin's experiments with planaria flatworms, it turns out that if you train it and then cut their heads off, the tail will regenerate a brand new brain that still remembers the original information. Which poses a profoundly big question. Where the information from the brain is actually stored then? This area of research holds the keys to pretty much every deep question of life. For one thing, these creatures are similar to our ancestors. They have true symmetry. They have a true brain. They're not like earthworms. They're a much more advanced life form and most importantly, planaria is immortal. There's no such thing as an old planaria. Levin found that genomes encode the proteins in cells, but not the body's anatomy or its regeneration. For instance, while stem cells have the potential to create the basic components of organs, it's currently impossible to manipulate individual cells to form complex structures, such as a functional human hand or eye. 
Using just bioelectricity codes, he achieved a completely different look from the default anatomy, without genomic changes. He believes that to fully unlock such potential, we need to shift focus from cellular hardware to biological software, which enables networks of cells to acquire, store, and act on information about organ and whole body geometry. In the computer world, shifting from rewiring hardware to reprogramming information flow revolutionized the IT industry. Similarly, biology could achieve futuristic visions of regeneration by shifting its focus to physiological software concepts. Planarian flatworms are a prime example, as they can regrow any part of their body until the correct anatomy is complete, after which growth stops. The big mystery is how the system identifies the correct target shape, orchestrates individual cell behaviors to achieve it, and determines when the job is done. It's important to note that not only nerve and muscle cells, but almost all cells in the body can participate in electrical communication. This is due to protein structures within cell membranes that transport various ions in and out of cells. The thing about these ion channels is that they have gap junctions, and that many of them are themselves voltage sensitive. A gap junction is something basically like a little tunnel that connects cells. According to Dr. Werner Lowenstein, the scientist who first proposed their existence, the single cell is not the fundamental building block of living organisms. Instead, it is the double cell connected by a gap junction that represents the true primary element. It is crucial to understand that gap junctions are not an unusual or infrequent occurrence. In fact, they are so prevalent that we can describe them as a universal characteristic of all living organisms on our planet. It means that it should have a deep evolutionary history. And in their joint peer-reviewed paper, two experimental physicists from the Department of Plasma Physics Complexity Science Group proposed a hypothesis that these bioelectronic circuits, the junction systems, are in fact a result of evolution initiated under the prebiotic Earth conditions by a simple spark. Spark that occurred in a medium, presumed to be a chemically reactive plasma, allowing it to evolve from the complex ball lightning systems into the contemporary cell. They wrote, quote, As revealed by nature, the creation of a living cell requires the self-assembly of a framework in the form of the cell membrane mainly constituted of lipids and proteins. The most important parts of this framework are the channels that, by a specific electric activity, control the matter and energy exchange between the nucleus of the cell and the surrounding medium. Why this gradient appears and acts is today a challenging problem of biology. An alternative explanation could be based on a self-organization mechanism. Such a mechanism becomes possible if a biological cell is the result of the evolution of a gaseous cell, formed by a cascading self-organization scenario. In that case, the membrane of the cell must contain, in order to ensure its viability, channels able to maintain a local gradient of different ion species. This could be possible if at the ends of the channels, microball lightning are situated with qualities remembering their recent history. This means that the micro-ball lightning preserves its initial ability to sustain and control an anomalous transport of matter and energy through the channel, by the described dynamics. It has obtained this ability during its creation under prebiotic Earth conditions. As mentioned, the complex space charge configuration, created in plasma by self-organization, also reveals other interesting phenomena, such as self-multiplication by division and exchange of information." End of quote. This scenario of self-organization shows striking similarities to those of living matter, and it could explain the emergence of primitive organisms from inorganic matter, hence paved the way for their evolution into contemporary cells. In their following peer-reviewed paper, they wrote, quote, Under such premises, the emerged electric skeleton, the spherical structure of elementary dipoles that border the minuscule ball of fire, potentially acts as a mold on which proteins and protein assemblies attach. Once emerged, their dynamic is governed by quantum mechanical forces. 
Playing functional roles at mesoscopic scales, the dipoles perform operations that remind that of living biological cells. End of quote. Their innovative idea that ionic channels have the microball lightning at the ends that make up the gap junctions correlates with the experiments of low-energy nuclear reactions and isotope transmutation in living systems. Now, it should be noted that in their paper, instead of using the term microball lightning, they employed the phrases micro-double layers or complex space charge configuration. Essentially, these terms refer to the same phenomenon known as plasmoids, balls of fire, microball lightning, itonic clusters, or exotic vacuum objects. Interestingly, all of these phenomena enable nuclear transmutation of elements. It's like a modern-day scientific version of alchemy, where atoms of one element can be magically transformed into atoms of another element through nuclear reactions. Transmutation in biological systems involves efficiently replenishing missing elements for growth. When essential elements are lacking, biological objects instantly capture synthesized elements through transmutation to sustain growth. In their joint peer-reviewed paper, Vladimir Vysotsky and Ala Kornilova wrote, the physical prerequisites of the transmutation process are related to the general issues of implementing low-energy nuclear reactions. In our opinion, supported by calculations and multiple comparisons with successful experiments, this mechanism is associated with the formation of coherent correlated states, which are formed and transformed in the growth zone of biological objects. For example, in the cell division area during DNA replication, on the surface of biological membranes. In fact, under certain conditions, each such object in the presence of suitable atoms or ions can act as a single-use micro-reactor for nuclear fusion. Based on such a mechanism, it is evident that the phenomenon traditionally referred to as biological transmutation is, in fact, ordinary nuclear fusion, the conditions for its realization being provided through natural processes automatically occurring in the growth zone of biological objects. A crucial point is that such reactions do not lead to the formation of radioactive nuclei which fundamentally sets them apart from reactions realized through genuinely accelerated particles. End of quote. These results are now experimental facts and the basis of patented cutting-edge technology. Therefore, the gap junctions serve not only as ion channels, but with the help of bioplasmoids that are sitting at the ends of these channels, congregate in vast quantities to form massive hexagonal arrays of nuclear fission microreactors along sheets of cell membrane. They also serve as a standardized kit assembly system in nature between living cells and construct communication channels thus are directly responsible for the long-range order and the fundamentals of life. Another cool thing is that a voltage-sensitive current conductance it has, that's a transistor. Now, living matter gets access to all of the neat stuff that transistors do. A transistor is an electronic component used to amplify and switch electronic signals. They are essential building blocks of modern electronic devices, such as computers, smartphones, and amplifiers. As a result, two cells with identical genes and membrane proteins can have very different electrical properties. So now, when you have a network of cells, not only do they talk to each other, but they can send messages to each other and the difference in voltage can propagate. This is possible because of the presence of solid-state-like semiconductors in living matter allowing electrons to travel long distances without losing energy, because in a semiconductor, the electron energy is preserved and passed on as information. Dr. Levin discovered that bioelectrical signals trigger complex chains of events. He also found that the genome doesn't encode instructions for organ placement, but rather encodes hardware that reduces the difference between current and target anatomy. This was a groundbreaking discovery, as he found that anatomy can be rewritten by bioelectrical stimuli and maintained indefinitely without genomic editing. For example, Levin's tail and head experiments showed that bioelectrical signals 
influenced the growth and identity of body parts. Bioelectric cues could not only determine where a new structure grew, but also what the new structure will be. For instance, altering ion channel or gap junction activity can trigger the bioelectric circuit that regulates head number and location in regenerating planaria, resulting in a species with two heads or two tails. Researchers can visualize voltages in groups of cells using fluorescent dyes that now very much remind electrons and energy levels which are known as Briouin zones. But most importantly, the body's bioelectric represents a new layer of information stored outside DNA. This is a biology software. And this new emerging field highlights the hardware-software distinction embraced by computer scientists but resisted by biologists. Therefore, in molecular biomedicine, the focus remains largely on manipulating cellular hardware, such as proteins, rather than exploiting the reprogrammability of life. Can this explain some exotic phenomena, such as miracles of healing reported in various historical accounts? If what we see is a gateway via some plasma-based interface discovered by COPE to the biological software that determines the work to be performed and controls operation of the genome hardware, this might explain how such things might work on this level. One can literally hack and patch the codes of bioplasmatic and bioelectric systems of any malfunctioning organ or tissue and force it to return to its healthy state. Genome hardware will follow providing all the organic material needed. And as experiments showed, such a fix will be permanent. This also enables us to start understanding the human interface that serves as our connection to the UFO UAP phenomenon. The concept of bioelectrical software assumes that there must be vulnerabilities that can be exploited. The recently declassified Australian Intelligence Service X-Files contain a fascinating section about individuals who were paralyzed but conscious during close encounters with the UAP phenomenon. Some information suggests that there were three so-called weapon systems. One was a device to interfere with electrical circuits, and the second was a device to induce paralysis that was able to intercept control of the body, very similar to a man-in-the-middle cyber attack. Quote, Such a handheld device, variously described as a small metal tube or flashlight, and in one case as a 60 centimeter long, 10 centimeter diameter tube. It is usually pointed at the victim, and sometimes a light is seen emanating from it, but often no light is reported. Operating distance, probably up to 10 meters. Victim is given a charge by one operation. End of quote. Is the level that the anomalous phenomena come into contact with human hardware bioplasmatic and bioelectric then? All living things, including humans, emit a type of light that is not easily detectable. This light is called biophotons, which are particles of light known as photons spontaneously emitted by living tissues. Bioluminescence, which is the light emitted by fireflies, jellyfish, and a few other creatures, and chemiluminescence, the light emitted by a chemical reaction in living things, are not the same as biophoton emission. While bioluminescence and chemiluminescence can be seen by the eye, biophotons cannot. Biophotons are emitted when electrons within an organism become energized or excited, and they can be useful for detecting and diagnosing health issues as well as indicating what is happening within the organism. Biophotons are so faint that they are what is known as ultra-weak emissions of light in scientific literature. There is compelling evidence to suggest that biophotons play a fundamental role in our existence. When the emissions of biophotons by our bodies is disrupted, it often indicates a serious illness. For instance, changes in biophoton emission rates are now recognized as the earliest possible sign of cancer. Biophotons were first discovered in plants by the renowned scientist Professor Alexander Gurvich, who was studying the growth of onion roots when he demonstrated their existence, though he did not refer to them as biophotons at the time. In the following years, most studies on biophotons used biological detectors that measured a specific type of light in the medium ultraviolet range 
which was originally called mitogenetic radiation. Although some scholars criticized these detectors, the most extraordinary early results they produced were accurate and have since been reliably verified using novel detection methods. Gurevich studied how cells divide and believed that something triggered this process. He didn't think this trigger was chemical, but instead that the organism as a whole used non-chemical signals to start cell division for its embryonic cells. Not only that, apparently such signals could transfer information that were capable of either healing or killing the cells. By changing the glass and quartz plates during his experiments, he quickly realized that emitting photons in the ultraviolet range were the signals at play. He named these signals mitogenic rays, which was later replaced by the term biophotons. He believed that the whole organism must coordinate the emission of ultraviolet photons, which he attributed to its morphogenetic field. He was a true visionary to come up with this idea, because there wasn't any physics works to explain how such a field might work at that time. It was only after his death, when physicists published a paper that introduced the concept of coherence, which helped explain Gurevich's field theory. He was very innovative, and was the first person to suggest the existence of collective states and cooperative phenomena within organisms, but which he called states of mutual alignment and orientation of molecules. Gurevich proposed that there was an organized redistribution of energy within the organism on a large scale, which triggered chain reactions of signal propagation. This spatial organization of the whole organism was more important than individual atoms and molecules, proving the existence of long-range order in biological fields. Biophoton study played a major role in shaping this larger picture but in-depth research was conducted by Inushin and Grishenka in the Soviet Union. They discovered a plasmatic state within living organisms that differed from inorganic plasma, being a cold plasma possessing a high degree of order. To put it simply, bioplasma is a concept that suggests the existence of a plasmatic state within living organisms, which emits biophotons as one of its manifestations. Inushin proposed the existence of a kind of bioplasma body, a plasmatic double that accompanies the physical body. He suggested that living systems are based on excitation-de-excitation dynamics, and bioplasma is a cold plasma created by the polarization of biological semiconductors. The problem with Inushin's work is that most of it was done for Soviet secret services that were researching various anomalous psi phenomena and is smoldering beneath the smoke of secrecy. However, certain psi phenomena could have a direct connection to the polarization of organic semiconductors as described by him. One of them is the emergence of a unique state of matter that has both matter-like and light-like properties, and that can undergo strong interactions with each other, leading to the formation of a state of liquid light. Liquid light combines a superfluid with a Bose-Einstein condensate, described as the fifth state of matter. As a fluid, such light can flow around objects and corners, so one can see what's hidden behind them. Normally observed at extremely low temperatures, this study achieved the same state at room temperature, creating a hybrid of light matter. In this state, turbulence is suppressed around obstacles, and it behaves as a macro-quantum object combining attributes of liquids, solids, and gases. It's speculated that this state may correspond to some components of superfluid states of dark matter. So, each polarization of semiconductors described by Inutian might allow living matter to create exotic quantum states on a macro level and at room temperatures. The existence of liquid light in living matter has not been experimentally proven yet, but it requires the presence of an electron hole plasma in semiconductors as one of the crucial elements for its creation. Such plasma's existence has already been empirically verified by Dr. Alexander Boychenka and published in this paper. In his following paper, he published results of his further experiments. During his research of biophotons and plants, something very intriguing was discovered. He wrote, quote, 
it was possible to identify in plants a highly organized variable substance formed from different grade electrically charged particles that collectively interact with each other and reflect the physiological state of plants as holistically organized systems. By its physical properties, this substance was very similar to the plasma of a gas discharge or semiconductors and proved to be extremely sensitive to environmental factors, especially to the action of electric or magnetic fields. And its changes occurred long before this action manifested itself at the anatomical and morphological level of plant organization, and regardless of whether such an action was exerted for the whole organism or part of it. End of quote. Such sensitivity to environmental factors is a very important finding. His research was specifically focused on electromagnetic field pollution and its negative influence on plants. But there is more to it. The long-term studies of biophotons and various species and varieties of plants have revealed significant changes in the brightness of the glow of plants' biostructures depending on the time of year. It is established that the maximum intensity of biophotons of various plants relates to the spring-summer period, and its decline is at least in the autumn-winter period. In addition, a noticeable change in the intensity of biophoton radiation was detected during the day. Alexander Boychenka notes in his paper that the results of his work on bioplasma may radically differ from those obtained for the same species and varieties of plants at other times of the year and even of the day. In fact, a similar seasonal effect was confirmed in this peer-reviewed study of human biophotons. They also found the seasonal dependency of biophoton emission rates from human hands that was similar to plants, with its lowest in autumn. This echoes the results of many years of research into changes in the rate of chemical and biochemical reactions carried out by Dr. Simon Schnull and other researchers. Many experiments have shown that during calm sun years, there is an influence on speed of various reactions in the laboratory experiments, and that it is much higher during active sun years, and this variation is consistent with the lunar phases. This is quite surprising since from the standpoint of current scientific knowledge, changes in the relative position of the Earth, Moon, and Sun do not affect processes of chemical reactions. Do we observe the participation of some intermediaries in the influence of the cosmos on such processes in complex systems? Freeman Cope proposed why it might happen in the paper we discussed before. Quote, Experimental evidence suggests that diffuse superconductive plasma may reach the Earth from the Sun, resulting in diurnal and seasonal fluctuations in rates of antigen-antibody reactions, as well as in rates of precipitation and crystallization of solids from solutions." End of quote. It was recently proposed that the important component of such superconductive plasmas from the Sun is flux of slow neutrinos, and some modern-day researchers come forward with an idea that this is the agent causing such seasonal fluctuations and other anomalous phenomena. Alexander Parkhomov was the one who reported in numerous papers and in his book that neutrino is not just an elusive substance dissolved in an infinite universe, it is also an important carrier of the links between the biosphere and the cosmos. It was his idea that the agent carrying space influences to Earth objects may be flows of slow neutrinos, one of the components of dark matter. He argues that the involvement of neutrino in the cosmic terrestrial links, along with other agents, might explain the cyclical nature of solar activity, lunar rhythms and biological processes, the dependence of a number of terrestrial processes on the location of planets, and galactic rhythms and biosphere processes, the conclusions other researchers also come up with. For instance, Professor Xu Wenzhou from the Department of Physics, Hwasong University. In this article, he reported the abnormal physical phenomena observed in experiments when the Sun, Moon, and Earth are in an approximately straight line. His research group held numerous observations of anomalies of physical character. These include, an unusual force of horizontal oscillation, strange changes in the pattern of grain sequence in crystals,
changes in wavelength of emission spectral of atoms or molecules, and changes in the rate of speed of atomic clocks. No mysticism is involved here. This effect might occur due to the gravitational lensing and intensification of the flux of slow or relict neutrinos from space by celestial bodies. The fourth chapter of Alexander Parkhomov's book, entitled Where Physics is Powerless, discusses his work on psi phenomena as an extension of his main experimental research on neutrinos. There is indirect evidence that he was involved in the Soviet psychic spy programs as well, and that it was this work that gave him the tools needed to provide a significant part of the puzzle. Through experiments, he established the fact that cosmic rhythms influence detectors sensitive to extrasensory effects as well. His suggestion then was that the carriers of cosmic Earth connections, including weakly interacting particles like neutrinos, are involved in such phenomena. At that time, he was interested in dowsing and how it might work, and came up with an idea that when slow neutrinos interact with matter, it's like light passing through a clear material, mostly no absorption, but at different interfaces like density changes, refraction, reflection, and scattering happen. This allows detecting underground objects illuminated by ultra-low energy neutrinos, akin to reflected light. Another indication of the validity of his hypothesis is that the effectiveness of dowsing is also variable, correlating with the same rhythms characteristic of seasonal superconductive plasma and neutrino flux changes that might well be a source of particle material needed for this phenomena. It's no surprise then that such seasonal properties correlate with biophoton emission and general manifestation of effects that are commonly referred to as parapsychological. Some researchers reported that an individual's extrasensorial abilities are often influenced by various factors, such as their environment, time of year, and time of day. This indicates that ESP is not necessarily paranormal per se, but rather an inherent characteristic of living organisms that is interconnected with natural systems, cosmic Earth bonds, and influenced by them. This is what Professor Vladimir Solnikov wrote in his work, quote, Our work on the study of a man and his relationship with the environment give us the right to conclude about the geometric similarity of plasma formations and physical fields of a man. Therefore, in certain conditions, a person can act as an intermediary and sometimes as a generator of plasma formations. End of quote. Despite being viewed as highly speculative and often ignored by academia, bioplasma and related phenomena gathered enough experimental and theoretical scientific data to be considered an essential part of life. Its functions encompass exploring exotic effects and looking into life's profound mysteries across time. Hence, bioplasma and bioelectricity concepts should be researched together and take their rightful place in the current and future scientific worldview. <laughs>